One of the most interesting parts of the Percy Jackson series are the Greek gods. Rick Riordan, the author of the series, did a great job blending Greek mythology with his own universe. In this video, I'm going to explain the origin of the Olympian gods, as well as explain the history of their home, Mount Olympus. For this video, I'm only talking about the Greek gods. I'm not going to go into any detail about their Roman counterparts. Before we start, I feel I have to say there will be spoilers for the Percy Jackson novels, so you've been warned. Now, let's get the video started. There are actually two generations of Olympian gods. The first generation are the six that were the children of the Titan Lord Kronos and his wife Rhea. This includes Zeus, Hades, Poseidon, Hera, Hestia, and Demeter. When they were born, Kronos was terrified that his children would overthrow him the same way he did to his father, Orinos. Because of this, when his first two sons and first three daughters were born, he ate them. However, they did not die because they were immortal. Rhea later became pregnant with Zeus, and a distraught Rhea heard the voice of Gaia, the goddess of Earth, advising her to give birth to her final child on the island of Crete, and Gaia told her that her youngest child would save the rest of her children. On Crete, Rhea gave birth to her sixth and final son, and she handed him over to the nymphs that attended his birth. The Earth goddess then gave Rhea a rock the same size as an infant, and Kronos ate that without looking, thinking that he had just eaten his final child. When Zeus grew up, he was finally old enough and strong enough to overthrow his father, and he returned to Kronos' palace to free his siblings. Disguised as a titan, Zeus tricked Kronos, and using a mixture of mustard and nectar, he made Kronos regurgitate his siblings. He also freed an army of Cyclopes. Is that the plural for Cyclops? Cyclopes? I don't know, I'm just gonna go with that. Anyway, Zeus freed an army of Cyclopes along with some other very helpful creatures, and he led a rebellion against the Titan army and his father. In appreciation for being rescued, the Cyclopes forged the Big Three, meaning Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades, their symbols of power. For Zeus, they made the Master Bolt, for Poseidon, they made the Trident, and for Hades, they made the Helm of Darkness. At first, the Titans had an advantage due to being more experienced, but in time, the gods themselves became experienced and fierce warriors too, and with the help of their new weapons, they were able to prevail. During the final battle, the gods gathered on Mount Olympus, the tallest mountain after Mount Orthrus, Mount Orthrus being the base of the Titans. Using the Master Bold, Zeus blew up the top of Mount Orthrus and toppled Kronos' black throne. The battle ended when Zeus cut Kronos into a thousand pieces and dropped him into the pits of Tartarus. The other titans that were part of the titan army were also chucked down there, though most other titans were not bad. The gods only condemned the ones that were part of the titan army. Zeus went on to be the lord of the sky and the king of the gods on Mount Olympus. He and his two brothers, Poseidon and Hades, decided to split the world up between the three of them. As I said, Zeus had the sky, Poseidon was made the god of the seas, and he ruled over Atlantis, and then Hades went on to be the god of death and ruled over the underworld. Going back to their three sisters, Hera became the goddess of marriage, and she was also the queen of Olympus after marrying Zeus. They really don't care about incest for the gods, which is sort of weird, but moving on. Hestia was made the goddess of the hearth and home, and finally, Demeter was the goddess of the harvest and agriculture. As the gods took over as the rulers of Earth, replacing the Titans, Mount Olympus became the gods' home. The city in the sky was originally formed over Greece. It resided in the clouds, did not connect with the ground, and could not be detected by mortals due to the mist, the thing that alters mortals' views of anything magical. The city was not shaken by winds, nor wet with rain. Snow had never fallen upon it, the air was outspread, clear and cloudless, and over it hovered a radiant whiteness. However, when Greece fell to Rome, Mount Olympus moved with the bulk of civilization, and it then resided above Rome. Then, years later, the city lived above England, then Germany, then Spain, and finally, it was above America, moving with Western civilization, and it was specifically over New York City. While on the ground in New York, there was only one way to get up there, and that was through the elevator in the Empire State Building, and it was on the 600th floor. To get up there, however, you must pass a security guard in the lobby who won't let you pass unless you have special authorization. Looking at the actual city, it was described as a paradise with golden palaces for the Olympian gods. It had parks, it had streets bustling with minor gods, godlings, nature spirits, demigods, and among them, hundreds of other creatures and beings from Greek mythology. The biggest and most sacred part of Olympus is of course the Hall of Gods. The gods each have a throne, and the thrones are arranged in the shape of a U around the hearth. Those that have a throne are part of the Divine Council. 
Looking at the big three, Poseidon and Hades did not live there with their youngest brother and the rest of the gods, as they had their own homes in the sea and underworld, but Poseidon did have a throne. The same could not be said for Hades, however, but after the events of the last Olympian, Hades does end up getting his own throne. Moving on to the second generation of the Olympian gods, most of them are the children of the first generation with the exception of a few. First, we have Hephaestus, who was the son of Hera. He has an interesting story. He did not have a father because Hera impregnated herself to have him. However, this made him come out deformed, and when Hera saw the unsightly appearance of her son, she threw him from Mount Olympus, crippling him forever. Hephaestus would later go on to be the god of blacksmiths and fire. Next, we have Athena. She was born to Zeus and a titaness named Metis, because as I said before, not all titans were bad, and Metis was Zeus's first wife before marrying Hera. Before Athena's birth, a prophecy had once foretold that Metis would give birth to a daughter and then a son who would be more powerful than their father. So when Metis was pregnant, Zeus tricked Metis into turning into the form of a fly, and he swallowed her whole. However, Metis still gave birth to Athena after being swallowed, and Athena grew inside Zeus's head. When Zeus had a terrible headache, Hephaestus, who we just talked about, split Zeus's head open, and Athena squeezed her way out. She would go on to be the goddess of wisdom and strategy. Next, we have Ares, who was the son of Zeus and Hera. He developed a love of violence that surpassed any other Olympian, and this made him the perfect candidate to become the god of war. For the birth of the twins Apollo and Artemis, they were born when Zeus had an affair with a titaness named Leto. When Hera found out that Leto was pregnant with her husband's baby, she cast a curse on her. A curse that made it so no land with roots in the earth could receive Leto when it was time for her to give birth, and yet, Leto could only give birth on land. Due to this curse, Leto was driven from land to land, but was unable to find a place to rest and give birth. She finally found refuge on the floating island of Delos. She convinced the inhabitants to let her give birth there. With the help of almost all of the goddesses, besides Hera of course, she first delivered Artemis and then Apollo. Apollo grew up to be the god of the sun, and Artemis was the goddess of the moon. Next, we have Dionysus, and he's an interesting case because he was born to Zeus and a mortal woman named Semele. This makes him the only Olympian god to have a mortal parent. When Hera discovered that Semele was pregnant, she disguised herself as an old woman and made Semele begin to doubt that the father of her child really was Zeus. While in disguise, Hera convinced Semele to ask Zeus to reveal his true form to prove it was really him, something that would of course kill Semele instantly because she was a mere mortal, but Semele did not know this. To make sure that he would do it, Hera told Semele to have Zeus swear on the river Styx beforehand. The next time Zeus visited her, Semele did as Hera advised, and though Zeus tried to get around it, he could not because he had sworn on the river Styx. When he revealed his true form, Semele was burned to ashes, but Zeus was able to save the infant and sewed him into his thigh. Dionysus remained there until he emerged fully grown. He went on to be the god of wine, but later he would receive a punishment from his father for chasing after an off-limits dryad who Zeus himself had his eyes on, and as punishment, he was put in charge of Camp Half-Blood for the next 100 years. Next we have Hermes. He was born to Zeus and Maia. Zeus in the dead of night secretly impregnated Maia, who liked to avoid the company of the gods by hiding in a cave. Hermes was born on Mount Selene, and after his birth, Maia wrapped him up in blankets and went to sleep. When Hermes got bigger, he crawled away on his own, and right away he started trouble with the other gods, specifically Apollo, stealing his cattle. And the final god for the second generation, we have Aphrodite. She's an interesting case, because she was technically not a first generation Olympian or a second. This is because she was not born from one of the first generation gods. Instead, her story begins when Kronos dismembered his father Oranos and threw his remains into the sea. His... <laughs> his genitals produce foam from which Aphrodite was born. <laughs> the sea eventually took her to the island of Cyprus in the Mediterranean Sea, and there she met three Horai, or seizing goddesses. They dressed her magnificently and escorted her to Mount Olympus. When she arrived to the city in the sky, her beauty caused the gods Zeus, Poseidon, Ares, Apollo, and Hermes to fall for her, but Hera being the god of marriage matched her with their deformed son Hephaestus, and they got married. Aphrodite would go on to be the goddess of love and beauty, matching her good looks perfectly. After the events of the last Olympian, Percy Jackson requested that more minor gods be granted positions on the Divine Council. These gods include Hebe, the goddess of youth, Hecate, the goddess of magic and witchcraft, 
Hypnos, the god of sleep, Iris, the goddess of the rainbow, and who is also the messenger of Olympus. We also have Nemesis, the god of retribution and balance, Nike, the goddess of victory, Tyche, the goddess of luck and fortune, and Triton, the messenger god of the seas. There are many more minor gods, of course, but those are the big ones that show up in the series. They're not really as important. This video was about the major Olympian gods. Maybe I'll make a video on the minor gods one day. Who knows? Anyway, hopefully you guys enjoyed this. A lot of you were asking me to do more Percy Jackson videos, so I tried to listen to you. Comment below what other Percy Jackson videos you'd want to see from this channel. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much for watching, guys. You can follow me on social media to see more of my personal life and more of this little dude. If you like this video, hit that like button and subscribe. I want to give a huge shout out to all my patrons listed below. If you want to be featured on the next video, plus get a bunch of other rewards, become a patron today. Again, thank you so much for watching and look out for more great Movie Flame videos on the way.